Hey everyone, uh, well we're back with part two of my seven part series uh, looking at the greatest guitar riffs from each decade and, uh, and how to play them. Uh, I previously uh, did my first episode on the 50s and uh, you can check that out if you like. I'll, uh, I'll put a link down below in the uh, description box right down there. Uh, but with this episode, we're going to fast forward one decade and have a look at the 60s. Lots of great riffs out of the 60s. Bit of a format change going forward, starting with this episode. Instead of amending the uh, tutorials to the end of the video and making the video well over an hour long, hour and a half, two hours long maybe, I'm going to provide separate video links to each one up in this corner as I play them. Uh, you can click on that link and it'll take you to a separate video uh, for the tutorial. I'll also provide all the links down in the description box. So that said, if you want to watch my video as sort of a countdown uh, and not know what's coming up next, I'd suggest avoiding the uh, description box for the time being if you don't want to know what all of my choices are ahead of time. Uh, I'm going to add a few honorable mentions here because there are so many great riffs from the 60s to choose from. And I have to include all of the big famous ones from the big guns of the 60s, like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. Uh, despite some of those obvious choices not being my particular personal favorites. So a few of the more obvious ones, uh, I'm going to start off with uh, a four pack of honorable mentions to cover some of the more obvious choices while including my own choices within the top 10. You follow? I hope so. Uh, so let's have a look at a few of those famous riffs that most would have in their top 10, but that I decided not to include. Uh, first up, probably Jimmy Page's most famous guitar riff and, and most well-known, the riff to Whole of Love by Led Zeppelin. Obviously a great classic riff from the 60s, just not my personal favorite Zeppelin riff. Uh, so let's throw this one in the honorable mentions. Uh, this is Whole of Love by Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin from 1969's Led Zeppelin II. <laughs> Next up, we have George Harrison and the Beatles uh, from 1965 with Day Tripper, uh, probably the most famous Beatles guitar riff. And uh, well, likewise, uh, the obvious choice. Uh, but I went with something a little bit less obvious for my choice, as you will see in a bit. Uh, this is the riff to Day Tripper by George Harrison and the Beatles from their 1966 album, Yesterday and Today. <laughs> And now, uh, as my third honorable mention, uh, usually everybody's favorite Rolling Stones riff, uh, certainly Keith Richards' most famous, uh, with the very well-known riff to I Can't Get No Satisfaction from their 1965 album Out of Our Heads. Uh, let's have a look at Satisfaction. <laughs> And uh, finally, a bit of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so many uh, great Jimi Hendrix riffs to choose from. And I've chosen one within my top 10 as well, of course. But I figured that I'd throw another classic here in the honorable mentions as well. Uh, this is track one, side one from Jimi's debut album, Are You Experienced? This is Purple Haze. <laughs>
Oh, and one more just for fun uh, by a fella named Monty Norman. Who the heck is Monty Norman, you may ask? Uh, well, he wrote this beauty that no one ever seems to mention when talking about the greatest guitar riffs of the 60s. It is from the 60s. It is a guitar riff. It's very iconic, very famous. So why don't more people talk about it? This is Monty Norman, whoever he is, and the riff from the theme to James Bond. So into the top 10 proper. Uh, first up, starting things off at number 10, we have John Fogarty and CCR with the fantastic riff to their hit song, Fortunate Son, from their 1969 album, Willie and the Poor Boys. Peaking at number three on the Billboard music charts in the latter months of 1969, the song would become a counterculture, anti-elitism, and anti-Vietnam War anthem at the time, and ever since has been featured extensively in pop culture, television, feature film depictions of the Vietnam War, and pretty much all anti-war movements that uh, followed throughout the years. Pitchfork Media placed it at number 17 on its list, of the 200 greatest songs of the 60s. Rolling Stone magazine placed it at number 99 on its 500 greatest songs of all time list. And in 2013, the song was added to the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Uh, this, all from a song written in 20 minutes by the great John Fogarty. And this is the classic riff to the important and lyrically profound classic rocker, Fortunate Son as my number 10 greatest riff of the 60s. At number nine from 1962 is the surf rock classic Miserloo by Dick Dale. Dale composed Miserloo on a bet from a young fan who challenged Dick Dale to play a whole song on one string. Now, Miserloo is an old traditional Arabic Mediterranean folk song from the early 1900s. Dick Dale recalled his Lebanese uncle playing the folk piece using only one string on an oud, one of these guys. Uh, and it inspired uh, Dale to take up this one-string challenge put to him by the aforementioned fan, and he took Miserloo, sped it up, rearranged, and readapted it to his surf rock guitar style that he was pioneering in the early 60s. Dale's surf rock version of Miserloo later gained renewed popularity when director Quentin Tarantino used it in the opening of his 1994 film Pulp Fiction and again when it was sampled by the Black Eyed Peas in their song, Pump It. So at number nine, this is the king of surf rock guitar, Dick Dale and Miserloo. <laughs> Number eight, uh, no list of the greatest riffs of the 60s would be complete without this incredible riff 
from a song released two months after I was born in 1964. And that riff would be from the number one hit, uh, Pretty Woman, by the late and great Roy Orbison. Actually, the, uh, the riff itself was not played by Roy Orbison, uh, despite Orbison being a guitar player of note at the time. There were actually four guitar players in the studio during the recording of Pretty Woman, and the responsibility for the intro riff fell to a fellow by the name of Billy Sanford, who was a fairly well-renowned country session player at the time. Uh, like I previously said, the song was a number one hit, uh, in the late summer of 1964, spending uh, three weeks at the top of the charts. And uh, like Fortunate Son uh, previously on my list, it has also been added to the Library of Congress's uh, National Recording Registry of Culturally and Historically Significant Songs of the Past. Uh, Pretty Woman has also been covered by numerous artists over the years, uh, most notably by two very different artists, uh, in particular uh, during the 80s, rappers, Two Live Crew, and rockers, Van Halen. Uh, Roy Orbison actually sued uh, Two Live Crew, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court of America, where Roy Orbison lost uh, over uh, fair use. And the ruling has become an important fair use legal precedent to this very day. Van Halen, on the other hand, released the song as a one-off and had their highest charting single to this point in their careers which forced the band back into the studio to rush out an album in support of the song's success. Uh, a very rushed, uh, short and cover-filled and basically disappointing album uh, called Diver Down. Uh, have a couple of great songs on it. Uh, Full Bug, great song. Uh, just for fun, I'm going to include uh, Two Live Crew's version alongside the original Roy Orbison version because of its cultural significance. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm going to include Van Halen's much heavier version because I absolutely love it. So this is number eight, and uh, this is Roy Orbison uh, with Billy Sanford and Eddie Van Halen on guitar and Pretty Woman. <laughs> My number seven is a bit out of left field, uh, and it's from George Harrison and the Beatles. Now, the Beatles had a hell of a lot of hits, uh, but this was not one of them. Uh, it's a riff to a song written by John Lennon, who actually considered the song a rubbish throwaway track from the band's brilliant 1966 album, Revolver. This is the opening riff, melody line to the Beatles and your bird can sing as my number seven greatest riff of the 60s. Now, first off, I suppose we need to discuss whether this is indeed a riff. Uh, some would call it a solo, uh, but I don't think it really meets the criteria of a guitar solo per se. It's more of a repeating melody line, uh, and in my opinion, a repeating melody line is what we'd call a riff. Uh, regardless, I'm calling it a riff. Uh, now, the original version of this riff uh, is actually uh, one of the very first uses of guitar harmonies in rock and roll music, which led to much confusion and frustration for a young guitar player out of Cleveland, Ohio at the time by the name of Joe Walsh of the Eagles. Uh, you see, Joe had no idea that it was two guitars. Uh, how could he, really? Uh, it hadn't been done before. Uh, Joe would spend months uh, trying to nail down this extremely, the extremely tricky guitar fingerings before he finally mastered it. Uh, he must have thought that George Harrison was some kind of guitar wizard uh, to come up with such intricate and uh, difficult guitar lines. Uh, a few years later, when uh, Joe started to achieve some level of success himself, 
he apparently met uh, Ringo Starr and began uh, discussing the song with him and just how George Harrison went about creating and playing that incredible riff, uh, explaining to Ringo his long periods of frustration in trying to master it. Uh, Ringo apparently looked at Joe like he was nuts, uh, laughed, and said, no, dummy, it was multi-tracked, it was two guitars, uh, George playing one and Paul playing the other. Now, instead of feeling the fool for his year or his months of uh, work, mistakenly mastering this riff on one guitar, he decided to look on the bright side. He proudly thought to himself, I am the only person in the world who can play And Your Bird Can Sing on one guitar, including George Harrison. And for a number of years, I'm sure that he was right. Uh, I'll be throwing some love to Joe Walsh here, and I'll tackle it on one guitar. Uh, and believe me, it's not easy, as, uh, as Joe Walsh found out. So this is And Your Bird Can Sing on one guitar as my number seven greatest riff of the 60s. Number six. Uh, at number six, we have what some call the very first grunge riff, uh, put down by Neil Young some 22 years before the genre even had a name. And that riff would be from Neil's classic Cinnamon Girl from his 1969 album, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. Uh, recorded and originally released in 1969, Neil didn't release the song as a single until mid-1970, whereas he had a modest hit with the track, reaching as high as number 55 on the uh, Billboard music charts. Uh, aside from its famous riff, uh, the song is also quite well known for its one-note guitar solo. Uh, so good that he performed it twice in the song. Uh, guitar World Magazine ranked the solo as the 76th greatest guitar solo of all time on their uh, Top 100 solo list. Uh, Neil would respond to uh, questions and critiques about his decision to do a one-note guitar solo by saying that it's actually not one note. Every one of those notes are different, he stated. Uh, well put, Neil. Uh, Neil is certainly one of those uh, guitar players who can put more feeling and emotion into uh, one note than uh, a lot of others can put into 20. Uh, the riff to Cinnamon Girl also utilizes Neil's well-used uh, double drop D tuning, whereas both E strings are tuned down to D. Uh, Neil would rely on this rather unorthodox tuning on a number of his famous songs, including Cortez the Killer, The Loner, uh, Ohio. Uh, so without further ado, this is my number six greatest riff of the 60s. Uh, this is Neil Young and Cinnamon Girl. <laughs> On to number five. Number five is actually two riffs, both from the same song. Uh, a song that some would call the very first heavy metal song of all time, uh, including its very own eccentric composer. And that composer would be Robert Fripp, and that song would be 21st Century Schizoid Man from the band King Crimson and the album In the Court of the Crimson King, released in 1969. I absolutely love this song. 
everything about it the title the lyrics the guitar riffs the the atonal guitar solo the jazzy middle bit the distorted vocals the difficult time signatures so on and so forth uh, however and considering that i'm a metalhead at heart i have to disagree with robert fripp's assessment of the track as being one of the first heavy metal songs of all time for one big reason and one smaller reason now, there's no doubt that the track was basically a prog rock's a big bang moment, uh, setting the stage and influencing numerous bands who would follow in uh, King Crimson's wake. But as far as being a heavy metal song, it has one definite strike against it. And that thing is called a saxophone. 21st century schizoid man is full of saxophone. Saxophone and heavy metal have never, and in my opinion, will never mix. Uh, it simply doesn't mix. They don't mesh. Uh, the second and less crucial determinant is that 21st century Schizoid Man is also rife with jazz, another genre that for the most part uh, cross-pollinates rather poorly with heavy metal music. Uh, regardless, uh, it's an absolute masterwork of hard rock and hard progressive rock, and its, it's powerful opening riff and jazz-infused infused bridge riff have been burned into my brain since the moment I first heard them when I was a teenager. So here we go at number five. This is Robert Fripp and 21st Century Schizoid Man from the Godfathers of Prague Rock, King Crimson. <laughs> On to number four, and at number four we have the great blues rock riff from the legendary guitarist Peter Green from the first iteration of Fleetwood Mac and the song Oh Well from their 1969 album Then Play On. Now, it's no secret that Peter Green flew just a bit too close to the psychedelic sun in the latter years of the 60s and would leave the band shortly thereafter because of severe LSD-induced mental problems. He would actually spend the next 25 to 30 years in and out of mental institutions. But when he shone in the 60s, he shone very brightly indeed. Uh, the song Oh Well, which was actually part of a longer composition, uh, has been viewed by some critics as one of, the, uh, one of the early crossovers between blues rock and heavy metal, along with songs by others such as uh, Led Zeppelin in the late 60s. Indeed, John Paul Jones admittedly drew inspiration from Oh Well when composing the riff to their very well-known song, Black Dog. Uh, the opening riff uh, to Oh Well was also heavily borrowed uh, from, some would say stolen, uh, by the band ACDC on their song Beaten, Beating Around the Bush from their 1979 album Highway to Hell. Uh, whether it was stolen by ACDC, borrowed, or influenced by, doesn't really bother me none. Uh, Beating Around the Bush is a kick-ass song and one of my favorite ACDC tracks and one of my favorite classic rock tracks in general. Uh, as is Oh Well uh, by early Fleetwood Mac and Peter Green. So this is number four, uh, my number four greatest riff of the 60s. This is Oh Well. <laughs>
And number three, I have a tie. Uh, basically because I had chosen 11 riffs by mistake and I didn't want to eliminate any of them. Uh, so a tie it is at number three. Uh, two great classic rock riffs. Uh, one from the Rolling Stones and one from Eric Clapton and Cream. Uh, first up, we have uh, Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones with the riff to Jumping Jack Flash. The riff and much of the song actually uh, apparently written by Bill Wyman, but credited to Keith Richards and Mick Jagger as songwriters, uh, which annoyed Bill Wyman to no end for many years. Uh, one of the group's more popular and, and most recognizable songs, it's the only song that the Rolling Stones had performed at every single show of their career since the song was released over 1,100 times. Uh, released in May of 1968, it shot straight to number one on the British music charts and as high as number three in America. Rolling Stone magazine listed as the 125th greatest song of all time, and the British music magazine Q listed at uh, number, the number two greatest guitar song of all time. I used to play this one in a band, and uh, it was always a blast uh, to play Jumpin' Jack Flash. Uh, so this is Jumpin' Jack Flash uh, as my first number three. As my second number three, we have a track released in November of 1967 from Eric Clapton and Cream from their Disraeli Gears album and the classic Sunshine of Your Love. This riff, uh, not unlike Jumpin' Jack Flash, was actually written by the bassist, uh, not the guitar player, and in this case, it was Jack Bruce. Uh, Bruce had just gotten home from seeing Jimi Hendrix live for the first time, and with his head still reeling from the experience, uh, pardon the pun, uh, he sat down and composed Sunshine of Your Love as uh, somewhat of a, a tribute and homage to uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, he brought it to the band and they would flesh it out over the following days uh, into a fully formed song. Uh, unsure of its potential as a hit song, it was actually the third release from the Disraeli Gears album after uh, the really Great Strange Brew, and oddly enough, Tales of Brave Ulysses. I can't believe they released Tales of Brave Ulysses as a single. Uh, the band, of course, would be proven wrong about Sunshine of Your Love. The song would become a worldwide hit and their highest charting song to date, and ha has gone down in history as one of the greatest rock and roll songs of all time. Uh, Hendrix himself, uh, the inspiration behind the track, would cover it live on numerous occasions uh, as an instrumental piece. So uh, without further ado, uh, this is Eric Clapton and Cream and Jack Bruce with uh, Sunshine of Your Love at number three, my second number three. <laughs> Down to number two, uh, and from Led Zeppelin 2, this is Jimmy Page and Heartbreaker. Uh, now, most would have Whole lot of Love uh, in this position, uh, but it's such an obvious choice that I thought I would go with something different. Plus, I prefer this riff uh, to Whole lot of Love, personally. Uh, Heartbreaker, while uh, having an absolutely killer opening riff, is probably more well known for its frenetic and chaotic uh, unaccompanied guitar solo uh, mid-song by Jimmy Page, 
uh, which I covered uh, as part of my effort to play through the top 100 guitar solos of all time. I'll link that down below as well if you want to check that out. Uh, producer Rick Rubin uh, has called the riff to Heartbreaker the greatest rock and roll riff of all time. And it's damn close, if you ask me. And the solo has inspired countless guitar players since its release, including the likes of Steve Vai and Eddie Van Halen. Uh, Heartbreaker was, and still is, one of Led Zeppelin's most memorable songs. And uh, during the 1970s, it was a part of every single set list for every concert, often used as an opener and uh, sometimes as an encore, but it was always there. Uh, interestingly enough, its companion piece, Living Loving Maid, which on the album starts so quickly after Heartbreaker ends as to be almost a continuation of the same song, was never played live. Uh, I found that kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, onward. Uh, classic, Led Zeppelin riff, Jimmy Page from one of the greatest riff masters of all time. This is my number two greatest riff of the 60s, and this is uh, Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page, Heartbreaker. All right, my number one greatest riff of the 60s. You may have been wondering, where is Jimi Hendrix? Oh, well, here he is at number one uh, with the incredible uh, Voodoo Child Slight Return. Uh, the obvious choice with this one, uh, but unlike going with the obvious choice when it came to Led Zeppelin, uh, I just could not have Voodoo Child uh, as my number one choice. Uh, you know, a modest hit upon its release it's shot to number one on the music, uh, the British music charts, uh, when it was re-released a few weeks after Jimmy's death. The only time that Jimi Hendrix reached the top of the music charts. Uh, however, the accolades for uh, Hendrix's Voodoo Child Slight Return are endless. Uh, number one on Guitar World Magazine's Greatest Wah Solos of All Time. Greatest Guitar Riff of All Time on Music Radar's list of the greatest riffs of all time. It also comes in at number 102 on Rolling Stone's list of the greatest songs of all time. That should be higher. Uh, guitarist extraordinaire Joe Satriani uh, has called it simply the greatest piece of electric guitar work ever recorded. Uh, and that the whole song could be considered the holy grail of guitar expression and technique. Uh, it is a beacon of humanity, he stated. Uh, now, I don't know about a beacon of humanity, but uh, it's some damn fine guitar playing uh, on Jimmy's part. So here we are at number one. This is Jimi Hendrix and my choice as the greatest guitar riff of the 60s and one of the greatest guitar riffs of all time. This is Voodoo Child's Slight Return. And that's it. I, I hope you enjoyed my top 16 greatest guitar riffs of the 60s. And uh, you want to learn any of them? There's links all over the bloody place here. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I had fun doing it. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with uh, the 70s. And God, there's a lot of riffs to choose from in the 70s. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm sure smoke on the water is going to be in there somewhere. So you guys take care of yourselves. And uh, we'll see you next time. Ciao.